Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm doing the first part of a seven-part video, I guess. So I picked up the box set of The Chronicles of Narnia, and uh, I've started reading through them. I've never read them before, I'm now 30 years old, so a little bit outside of the target audience. But um, as I'm reading through them, I thought I'd take notes on them as I read, and then report back to you on my thoughts. So today I have for you The Chronicles of Narnia, The Magician's Nephew, book number one. The adventure begins. On a daring quest to save a life, two friends are hurled into another world, where an evil sorceress seeks to enslave them. But then the lion Aslan's song weaves itself into the fabric of a new land, a land that will be known as Narnia. And in Narnia, all things are possible. And yeah, this very much is like setting up. It actually literally includes Aslan becoming god and creating Narnia. But I also actually like the kind of adventure story element to it to begin with. So that was quite cool. And there was also some like world hopping in this as well, which was was impressive so I'm gonna go through and check out some of my notes anyway so we start with chapter one the wrong door and I think this is these two opening paragraphs are, are fantastic this is a story about something that happened long ago when your grandfather was a child it is a very important story because it shows how all the comings and goings between our own world and the land of Narnia first began in those days mr. Sherlock Holmes was still living in Baker Street and the Bastables were looking for treasure in the Lewisham Road in those days, if you were a boy, you had to wear a stiffy and collar every day, and schools were usually nastier than now. But meals were nicer, and as for sweets, I won't tell you how cheap and good they were, because it would only make your mouth water in vain. And in those days, there lived in London a girl called Polly Plummer. So bearing in mind this was written when? Does it, does it actually tell me? Copyright 1955, so at least before then. Well, I suppose he was contemporary with Tolkien, wasn't he? So, and, um... I don't know, like, looking back even further from that, I thought it was quite interesting. I also love this description of, uh, they, they go through the door in the attic, and, uh, so I'm gonna read this out. It was shaped, of course, like an attic, but furnished as a sitting room. Every bit of the walls was lined with shelves, and every bit of the shelves was full of books. A fire was burning in the grate. You remember that it was a very cold, wet summer that year. And in front of the fireplace, with its back towards them, was a high-backed armchair. Between the chair and Polly, and filling most of the middle of the room, was a big table piled with all sorts of things. Printed books, and books of the sort you write in, and ink bottles, and pens, and sealing wax, and a microscope. But what she noticed first was a bright red wooden tray with a number of rings on it. They were in pairs, a yellow one and a green one together, then a little space, and then another yellow one and another green one. They were no bigger than ordinary rings, and no one could help noticing them because they were so bright. They were the most beautiful, shiny little things you can imagine. If Polly had been a very little younger, she would have wanted to put one in her mouth. And these rings also become very important later in their story. They're kind of what allow the kids to travel between the different worlds. So yeah, they end up in this like world between the worlds where there are all these different pools. And by jumping into one of the pools with the right ring on, they can travel between worlds. And we have this scene here where they've just arrived at the wood between the worlds. Polly looked puzzled. Don't you see? said Diggory. No, do listen. Think of our tunnel under the slates as home. It isn't a room in any of the houses. In a way, it isn't really part of any of the houses. But once you're in the tunnel, you can go along it and come out into any of the houses in the row. Might and this would be the same. A place that isn't in any of the worlds, but once you've found that place, you can get into them all. So I just thought it was kind of fun, because this is stuff I normally associate with sci-fi and like, you know, the many universe theory and stuff like that. And here it is with uh, <laughs> C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. I like this description, so they start to go back to their own world, but um, they're going to shout change if they want to change rings and go back to the place with the pool, so they just want to check it's the right world, you know? They put on the green rings, took hands, and once more shouted, one, two, three, go. This time it worked. It is very hard to tell you what it felt like, for everything happened so quickly. At first there were bright lights moving about in a black sky. Diggory always thinks these were stars and even swears that he saw Jupiter quite close close enough to see its moon. But almost at once there were rows and rows of roofs and chimney pots about them, and they could see St Paul's and knew they were looking at London. But you could see through the walls of all the houses. Then they could see Uncle Andrew, very vague and shadowy, but getting clearer or more solid looking all the time, just as if he were coming into focus. But before he became quite real, Polly shouted change, and they did change, and our world faded away like a dream, and the green light above grew stronger and stronger, till their heads came out of the pool and they scrambled ashore. And there was the wood all about them, as green and bright and still as ever. The whole thing had taken less than a minute. So they're cool. There we go. A little bit of world hopping there. We have this bit where the two kids, they see a bell. And the bell has this rhyme. Make your choice, adventurous stranger. Strike the bell and bide the danger. 
Or wonder till it drives you mad what would have happened? Or wonder till it drives you mad what would have followed if you had? No fear, said Polly. We don't want any danger. Uh, oh, but don't you see it's no good, said Diggory. We can't get out of it now. We shall always be wondering what else would have happened if we had struck the bell. I'm not going home to be driven mad by always thinking of that. No fear. And so because of that, of course, he strikes the bell. And that ends up summoning the evil witch, who I assume becomes the bad character in the next book. But I don't know yet. So it summons this queen to life. And she talks about this battle. And she says, it was my sister's fault. She drove me to it. May the curse of all the powers rest upon her forever. At any moment, I was ready to make peace. Yes, and to spare her life too. If only she would yield me the throne. But she would not. Her pride has destroyed the whole world. Even after the war had begun, there was a solemn promise that neither side would use magic. But when she broke her promise, what could I do? Fool! As if she did not know that I had more magic than she. She even knew that I had the secret of the deplorable word. Did she think, she was always a weakling, that I would not use it? And then Diggory says, what was it? That was the secret of secrets, said the Queen Jadis. It had long been known to the great kings of our race that there was a word which, if spoken with the proper ceremonies, would destroy all living things except the one who spoke it. But the ancient kings were weak and soft-hearted and bound themselves and all who should come after them with great oaths never to even to seek after the knowledge of that word. But I learned it in a secret place and paid a terrible price to learn it. I did not use it until she forced me to. And I just think the idea of the deplorable word is fantastic, although it makes me wonder what the word is and assume it's probably the C word, isn't it? Eventually they take the witch back to uh, our world to meet their, their, their uncle, or the uncle, sorry. He's only the uncle of the boy and the girl lives next door. So she says, Peace, you talk far too much. Listen to your first task. I see we are in a large city. Procure for me at once a chariot or a flying carpet or a well-trained dragon or whatever is usual for royal and noble persons in your land. Then bring me to places where I can get clothes and jewels and slaves fit for my rank. Tomorrow I will begin the conquest of the world. I, I'll, I'll go and order a cab at once, gasped Uncle Andrew. And I think that's a delightfully British response. There's very much like a dry humour throughout this book. And then the witch tries to cast some magic. And she discovers that she can't do magic in our world, so Aunt Letty just thinks that she's drunk. There's also this bit of sort of foreshadowing. It's not very subtle, to be honest, for an adult reader, where one of the characters says, uh, uh, I'm afraid for it, we would need fruit from the land of youth to help her now. Nothing in this world will do much. And uh, I believe that's about Diggory's mother, who isn't very well. And so, of course, he gets the bright idea of, well, maybe in one of these worlds there's something that can help her. We get a point at which the witch gives somebody a black eye. And uh, a butcher's boy says, You ought to put a nice raw beef steak on it, mister. That's what it wants. And it is true, I've heard that before, like the old wives' tale, that if you put a steak on a bruise or on a black eye, it will reduce the swelling. I don't know whether there's any science in that. Has anyone ever tried that? Here's where we're about halfway through, we start to get very religious. So, for example, we get a reference to the first voice, the deep one, which, the, which had made things appear and made them sing. And then we meet a lion and... Uh, 10 points if you can guess who the lion is. I mean, I obviously know enough of, uh, enough of enough Narnia sort of popular culture, I guess, to know that it's La Aslan. And uh, Aslan is basically God. So here we have chapter 9, The Founding of Narnia. The lion was pacing to and fro about that empty land and singing his new song. It was softer and more lilting than the song by which he had called up the stars and the sun, a gentle rippling music. And as he walked and sang, the valley grew green with grass. It spread out from the lion like a pool. It ran up the sides of the little hills like a wave. In a few minutes it was creeping up the lower slopes of the distant mountains, making that young world every moment softer. The light wind could now be heard ruffling the grass. Soon there were other things besides grass. The higher slopes grew dark with heather. Patches of rougher and more bristling green appeared in the valley. Diggory did not know what they were until one began coming up quite close to him. It was a little spiky thing that threw out dozens of arms and covered these arms with green and grew larger at the rate of about an inch every two seconds. There were dozens of these things all around him now. When they were nearly as tall as himself, he saw what they were. Trees, he exclaimed. And then they di the uncle discovers that, uh, I think it's, what is it? Oh yeah, the, the witch tore off a lamppost at home and when she planted it into the ground in Narnia, it came up as like young lampposts. And we have this little exchange. That's it. Stupendous, stupendous, said Uncle Andrew, rubbing his hands harder than ever. Ho, ho. They laughed at my magic. That fool of a sister of mine thinks I'm a lunatic. I wonder what they'll say now. I have discovered a world where everything is bursting with life and growth. 
Columbus, now, they talk about Columbus. But what was America to this? The commercial possibilities of this country are unbounded. Bring a few old bits of scrap iron here, bury them, and up they come as brand new railway engines, battleships, anything you please. They'll cost nothing, and I can sell them at full prices in England. I shall be a millionaire. And then the climate, I feel years younger already. I can run it as a health resort. A good sanatorium here might be worth 20000 a year. Of course, I shall have to let a few people into the secret. The first thing is to get that brute shot. You're just like the witch, said Polly. All you think is of killing things. Which is kind of true, but also kind of not. He does the depressingly human thing of all he thinks about is the prophet. Which, in this case, is the same thing, you know? And then we get um, Aslan. He, he says these magical words. Let there be... Oh, no, that's a different book. He says, Narnia, Narnia, Narnia. Awake, love, think, speak. Be walking trees. Be talking beasts. Be divine waters. We also have the bit that then Uncle Andrew collapses and the animals are investigating him. So he's fainted and they think he must be a tree because they've never seen anyone faint before. And the, the most comparable thing is a tree falling down. And then they think, oh, well, if he, if he is a tree, he must be planted. We must dig a hole. So I'm going to read this out. He, he narrowly escapes like a really dreadful fate. The two moles settled that part of the business pretty quickly. There was some dispute as to which way up Uncle Andrew ought to be put into the hole, and he had a very narrow escape from being put in head foremost. Several animals said his legs must be his branches and therefore the grey fluffy thing, they meant his head, must be his root. But then others said that the forked end of him was the muddier and that it spread out more, as roots ought to do. So finally he was planted right way up. When they had patted down the earth, it came up above his knees. So it's a bit like when you, like, as a kid, you bury a family member in the sand at the beach. But I also just like that idea that if they'd buried him the other way around, he would have suffocated to death with mud in his mouth. And then Aslan calls, um, what's his name, Diggory, he calls him Son of Adam, which is obviously very biblical. I also like this exchange when they're, they're travelling as well. I wish we had someone to tell us what all those places are, said Diggory. I don't suppose they're anything yet, said Polly. I mean, there's no one there and nothing happening. The world only began today. No, but people will get there, said Diggory, and then they'll have histories, you know. Well, it's a jolly good thing they haven't now, said Polly, because nobody can be made to learn it. Battles and dates and all that rot. But I also think it's a very good point, like the history that's going to come of a place. You sometimes think that when you see things, you know. Then we have this bit where, so basically the kid has to get an, an apple for Aslan, and uh, he sees these letters on the gates. Come in by the gold gates or not at all, take of my fruit for others or forbear. For those who steal or those who climb my wall shall find their hearts despair desire and find despair and then the witch is basically playing the role of the serpent you know i know what errand you have come on continued the witch for it was i who was close beside you in the woods last night and heard all your counsels you have plucked fruit in the garden yonder you have it in your pocket now and you're going to carry it back untasted to the lion for him to eat for him to use you simpleton do you know what that fruit is i will tell you it is the apple of youth the apple of life i know for i have tasted it and I feel already such changes in myself that I know I shall never grow old or die. Eat it, boy, eat it, and you and I will both live forever and be king and queen of this whole world, or of your world, if we decide to go back there. So that's kind of interesting because basically he decides not to eat it, and so it's almost positioned as though Narnia is the Garden of Eden without sin. And I saw someone else talking earlier about the similarities between Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials and uh, C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, and that they're both kind of... I suppose books geared towards children, but that we just teach them what to think about religion, <laughs> or at least have a religious undertone to them. Foreman's book is based on Paradise Lost as well, which tells the story of the Garden of Eden, which I think is just very interesting. So the, the His Dark Materials books have a lot about sin, and what would have happened if man had never eaten the apple. Anyway, uh, what's his name? The uncle finally regains consciousness, and so the animals decide to take care of him, and this is a great little paragraph as well. The donkey collected great piles of thistles and threw them in, but Uncle Andrew didn't seem to care about them. The squirrels bombarded him with volleys of nuts, but he only covered his head with his hands and tried to keep out of the way. Several birds flew to and fro, diligently dropping worms on him. The bear was especially kind. During the afternoon he found a wild bee's nest, and instead of eating it himself, which he would very much like to have done, this worthy creature brought it back to Uncle Andrew. But this was in fact the worst failure of all. The bear lobbed the whole sticky mass over the top of the enclosure, and unfortunately it hit Uncle Andrew's slap in the face. Not all the bees were dead. The bear, who would not at all have minded being hit in the face by a honeycomb himself, could not understand why Uncle Andrew staggered back, slipped, and sat down. And it was sheer bad luck that he sat down on the pile of thistles. And anyway, as the warthog said, quite a lot of honey has got into the creature's mouth, and that's bound to have done it some good. 
They were really getting quite fond of their strange pet and hoped that Aslan would allow them to keep it. The cleverer ones were quite sure by now that at least some of the noises which came out of his mouth had a meaning. They christened him Brandy because he made that noise so often. And I think I'd be calling for Brandy there too. And then of course because... Uh, because the uncle has made himself like deaf to the animals Aslan says this he thinks great folly child this world is bursting with life for these few days because the song with which I called it into life still hangs in the air and rumbles in the ground it will not be so for long but I cannot tell that to this old sinner and I cannot comfort him either he has made himself unable to hear my voice if I spoke to him he would hear only growlings and roarings oh Adam's sons how cleverly you defend yourselves against all that might do you good but I will give him the only gift he is still able to receive. And what I think is interesting there again, is that kind of ties back to, again, his dark materials and dust, original sin, and the idea that as you pass your adolescence, you kind of, your demons take a firm shape, even Ly uh, Lyra stops being able to read the alethiometer. So there's definite, definitely in both this and his dark materials, this dividing line between the children characters and the adult characters. I think that's quite interesting. All right, so my camera just cut out again, but there we have it. That is what I thought of The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. I gave this a pretty solid four out of five, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the series. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read the Narnia books, and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.